we are beginning the last two <clears throat> of our sequence on chaplaincy training here today. This, these are the two optional courses or at my option. <clears throat> I've added them onto the 12 that were required by the ICPC because I think it's needed. I think um, these are especially important, especially the second one we'll do today, which has to do with ride along and crime scene integrity, which for some reason, nobody knows why uh, it never was included in the International Conference of Police Chaplains training, 12 basic uh, courses, but I think it's essential. So uh, I'm going to go on uh, share screen for the first one, which is cop psychology. And here we go, gentlemen. I'll shrink that down there and we're looking like you are here. <clears throat> okay, class number 13, Cop Psychology 101. The reason I know about uh, some of this is not only doing 25 years with the Chico PD as a police chaplain, but I had um, the annual training session for the ICPC was held once in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the uh, Michigan State Police um, Psychology Unit, three of their uh, members, came down and did three days of intensive high-level advanced training uh, about things to do with um, cop psychology and uh, three full days of it. <clears throat> and uh, so I'll give you the benefit of some of what I learned from them. Um, what I may not touch on is one of the, one of the days was about cop, cop psychology with regard to cop suicide and how um, police officers <clears throat> who do commit suicide are generally doing it for a different reason and out of a different psychological pocket than the most of the people in the world who commit suicide because they're depressed uh, or they're feeling hopeless and they're they have a low a low vision of themselves and and they're they're helpless and they're therefore they're just capable enough to end it all <clears throat> cops do it for a different reason generally speaking they will take themselves out because they are, uh, well, as we'll see, they are attuned to doing the bad guy in. They want to get rid of the threat uh, and cancel the, the problem guy. But when that problem guy is themselves, uh, they take a kind of a, <clears throat> uh, a, t a, a tough decision and get themselves out of the picture. <clears throat> but let's, let's talk about what makes them tick. Name some personality traits that are common to most officers. Can you, you're all online. I'm not going to squelch your microphones. What things would you all say are personality traits of a law enforcement officer? Type A personality, leader, decisive. A, leader, decisive. Yeah, good. Anybody else? Okay. They live on the edge. They're very uh, uh, just. They just take charge. They want to take charge. That's true. Good. <clears throat> Here are some. Those were good. Here are some. They're committed. Uh, they have a le high level of integrity. They are dis disciplined. They're brave. They're courageous. They are careful. Uh, they must be all of these things may or may not be native to them, but they need to train themselves in this. They got to be honest. Uh, it's bad for a cop to be found out to be dishonest. Uh, they are selfless. They give of themselves. They're confident. They're observant. I'll say um, when I'm riding along and I see an officer sudden, suddenly take a sharp right turn and I didn't see a thing, but he saw a guy two blocks down on a bicycle that he's been looking for for six weeks, who he's going to search. Um, they, they catch it out of the corner of their eye, and they are observant. Uh, he's a servant. <clears throat> he's physically fit, he or she. Um, he, they are decisive, um, multitask or oriented. Uh, that's more even with the dispatch than the cops. Ethical, uh, they think on their feet, they can be compassionate. Cla traits of clergy, ideally, <clears throat> many of those that I've just mentioned above are 
typical of the clergy. That first class we gave you are the similarities between officers and clergy. Uh, you'll recognize that we were talking about both of those things as has to do with uh, the same kind of traits. <clears throat> Plus, we are faithful, that is, faith, full of faith, spiritual, have management skills, and are mature, as can be many cops. Confidential, we know how to handle confidentiality. We hopefully know how to manage our time, though that's a real challenge sometimes. Uh, we've got to have monetary management skills and, uh, and family management skills as well. So you mentioned they are in control. That is absolutely so. Cops need to be in control. And when they aren't, they seize the control. This is for the officer's safety and for reduction of general threats because they come in on an out of control situation to bring control back. <clears throat> Cops have a great difficulty when they're not in control of the events. Things do get out of control. Some of the things they can't govern like their own families. Uh, the position that they hold uh, and those officers who rank above them. <clears throat> and sometimes they, what gets out of control is themselves. They must learn and practice in an atmosphere of trust. Um, I was blessed many years ago to go out on a, um, a trust building uh, rope course training that ha had a lot to do with uh, trusting the fellows who had control of the ropes that were keeping you from falling to your death. <clears throat> and I went up on a 30 foot structure and was held up by the ropes that they were holding from below. And so did they all. It was pretty cool. Cops suffer from distrust and skepticism due to their jobs. They don't believe in human nature, except that they believe it's corrupted. <laughs> and they have a lot to, to base that on. Everyone must first prove their trustworthiness to a cop. So um, you prove to them that you, you can stand in the, in the gap and do it for them. Public honesty and integrity are rare traits for cops. They don't see it. They see dishonesty and, um, <clears throat> and poor character too often. They suffer a lot of disillusionment. In order to avoid feeling foolish, cops will distrust first, and then you have to earn their trust. This distrust is re reinforced by their job. Ask a cop about clergy. Hey, what do you think about um, these ministers? What, what would they say? What is it that they recall in hearing about Christian ministers? Well, they, uh, they have sexual uh, perversion with little boys. At least that's, that's the way they orient it. If they read the cop, you know, sort of the, the crime sheet, on some clergy somewhere uh, being bad, that tends to color their, rep their representative idea of clergy everywhere. Cops usually have a very small circle of trusted people that they can call their friends. Uh, and everybody outside that circle is not to be trusted. This reinforces the perceived untrustworthiness of others. Cops give great loyalty to their trusted circle and they cover one another. Uh, that's the code. <clears throat> they are strongly in an authority structure and they have the carry authority. Cops give great respect for authority and expect authority to be respected at work, on the streets, and as well at home. They hold the power to remove another person's freedom. That's a lot of authority. They're keenly aware of the signs and symbols of authority, strong identity, gun, badge, these speak authority. When an officer is forced to give up his gun, he needs to be given another gun. We've talked about that in uh, police-involved shootings. The badge is a remnant of the shield from the warrior culture. Uh, if you held up your shield, you were protecting you, and you were also very often protecting the man or men yet next to you. <clears throat> Roots of authority concept come from family origins and parents. Um, cops can come from their very greatly authoritarian family structure or maybe one that's all broken up and they're doing this to compensate for it. But the, um, the idea of authority comes from youth. Cops become authoritarians, expect obedience, can be quite rigid sometimes. 
uh, that's what we call being badge heavy. And uh, we don't want cops being over authoritarian just to bear their authority well, because they do uh, wear the sword for a reason. Dominance is expressed, submission is expected when they're in a situation that's calling for it. They are loyal. After trust is established, their loyalty is forever, or at least until it's violated. Loyalty to a partner can be a code of silence to go beyond all other loyalties. You don't rat out your brother, and that's often the case. Um, you don't want somebody to go over the, the edge and start hurting people, but um, they're really reticent on uh, speaking against their brother officers. <clears throat> Loyalty to go to, can, can get to an unethical behavior and cover up. There's a movie, 16 Blocks, I've been told, uh, has, has a great portrayal of this, and I haven't seen the movie. Uh, it can be a kind of blind trust. <clears throat> they are conservative, religiously, uh, as well as uh, politically. Tops can tend to hold traditional beliefs and values. They're patriotic. They enjoy a strong work ethic. <clears throat> they, they believe in a traditional family structure, sexual values. The, law, the rule of law is to be obeyed. They can be politically conservative, pro-government, pro-military, and conservative on social issues. <clears throat> um, they don't like a lot of change in that respect. They are or tend to be religiously conservative, drawn to traditional churches, hold such worldviews in, in kind. They have that understanding of humanity and religious positions and values. Chaplains tend to be likewise conservative, although uh, in the Chico PD, we've had a range of, uh, here comes Mark, a range of, uh, I guess what we call, you know, religious uh, conservative or, or uh, liberal, but they hold common values with the cops and don't have strife with law enforcement style and goals and issues by and large. Religious liberals may tend to shy at all the weaponry uh, and peace through power and strength kind of terminology. What they may experience is intolerant attitudes. I'd say that um, in, in this place of possible um, conflict or strife, um, the homeless issue can be a, a case in point where uh, everybody who's Times, tends to be on the conservative end uh, is, a, is a little put out with the homelessness and sees it as lawless and um, and all the coddling to it is detrimental and uh, one of these people get a job or go somewhere and clean themselves up and get off the drugs and off the booze and uh, clean do something with their lives and we get impatient with that whereas uh, the liberal values can look at them as, as a as a sad case, they're broken and we need to have, as, as Christians, we need to have compassion and be doing things for them. <clears throat> um, that sort of conservative versus liberal attitude may uh, rub a little in your chaplaincy. Uh, the police have what is called dichotomous thinking. Dichotomy means two opposites. Things are either black or white, they're right or wrong legal or illegal, moral or immoral, good versus bad, winners versus losers, good guys, bad guys, black hats, white hats. No shades of gray, no nuances. It's either right or it's wrong. They like things in efficient, clear-cut, easy categories. Mark and Jeff, we're doing um, cop psychology 101. This is some stuff I gleaned from some um, annual training stuff on the national basis. They can be a bit judgmental. Cops are good judges of people and character. They quickly assess somebody and decide whether they are the person who's done the wrong thing here or they're okay. Quick to size up a person. This is essential to their safety and it's a great skill that they work on. So we can call it judgmental, but we can. it doesn't necessarily carry a bad idea. They have a lot of experience leading to their judgmental attitude. 
they can have judgments of all others, their own fellow officers sometimes. When they judge, their judgment tends to be final. I was riding with a, uh, an officer named Ted Lopez once. We were tracking down on an apartment burglary where two young guys in an apartment got broken into through their front window at night uh, while they were in their bedrooms. And they came out and discovered the guys as they're uh, carrying off an Xbox and a gigantic screen TV and some, some DVDs and stuff. And they saw them get away uh, and identified by a sticker, uh, uh, the getaway vehicle. Um, Officer Lopez and I went to a place where we thought there was going to be something like that and discovered that that vehicle uh in front of another apartment building went and rang at the door of that uh vehicle owner and uh, he came out in a towel and um, then we said why don't you go and get your pants on he came out he seemed young and very innocent uh in, a, in respect and my officer was questioning him and as the questions got more and more direct and more uh interested he finally said, no, nah, no, nah, that your answer was lying there. I'm telling you, son, you were lying to me. I could tell the way you looked right there because I, I have that on. Um, are these items in your possession right now? Well, 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 you know, and he just talked him into confessing basically on the on the stair step there. We went into the bedroom and there's the there's the TV and there's the Xbox and there's all the stuff that they stole in this kid's bedroom. Um, he had great six senses of what he was talking to. Although I would have said the kid kind of looks just like a nice kid who's kind of small and wiry. They can be very competitive, highly competitive. In fact, who's the best? Uh, athletics, foot chases, pursuits, number of tickets, DUI arrests, etc. Um, many of these things are tracked and rewarded. Uh, and so they um, will feel pretty good about the accomplishments. They may compete with other units, law enforcement uh, departments, may therefore could give poor communication, cooperation, but I, I think that that usually is not the case. Two SWAT teams coming at the same location, I think would be a difficulty because they are an absolute take charge of a scene situation. I win, you lose. And there's a shame in losing or being a loser. Uh, we had a mounted unit here in Chico for a dozen or so years uh, that was really highly effective. And I've mentioned them before. Three of them were draft horses, big, gigantic Belgians uh, with, with hoofs like pie plates. They were just big, they were enormous. You could not, um, a human being couldn't do anything against a horse like this. Three of those like that. And then a very small female officer on a quarter horse who would be like the the, <clears throat> the mobile unit <clears throat> could go, <clears throat> excuse me, quickly out and move individuals back into the shelter of the three big horses and they had nowhere to go. Uh, it was a really neat unit. They went on competitions and in statewide competitions, they were winning. It was a pretty cool thing. And it's cool that our chaplaincy could help them with it. Ah, uh, the macho. <clears throat> you all know where that movie is from, right? It's, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this is Despicable Me too. Okay. Machismo, an exaggerated sense of masculinity, stressing such ad attributes as physical courage, virility, aggression, violence, and dominance of women. <clears throat> Just got a little something in my back of my throat. Police are real men. They're tough. They're strong. They're not weak. <clears throat> they want to carry themselves that way. They're always portrayed this way. And it's not always exactly like this, but this is a tendency. Weakness may be described in feminine terms like girly men, panty waist, puss and wuss and sissy and so forth. Strength, the ability to take it. Courage, playing hurt. And we value these kinds of uh, male uh, attributes in, in policing. And in fact, many female officers feel they've got to compete in this manner, uh, which is kind of odd because women in police world 
uh, are really kind of an interesting anomaly. It's a recent addition to policing, of course, relatively recent. If policing goes back a couple hundred years, women have been poli in police in just our lifetime. And they've had a hard time breaking into the, uh, the field. They're like the daughters of the pioneers. They're, they're women who have to do a lot of men's jobs. They are, of course, still a minority uh, in the gender of police forces. And they have to prove themselves, sometimes double up. They got to butch up, overachieve, be talk tough, um, prove they can and will back up a male officer, even though the male officer is twice her size. They may have the personality of a female officer is that they must, they can have better verbal skills sometimes as their male counterparts, but they don't fit the stereotypes. They may date and marry in reverse stereotypes, uh, but they hit the glass ceiling because uh, advancement some kind, sometimes can be less than encouraging. And we had a, a Chico PD officer here, uh, Jen Gonzalez, who um, advanced up through the ranks of lieutenant, I believe, is, is what she achieved here at Chico. But she got a, a job offer and went over and was able to, to become the chief of police in the, the city of, uh, um, just, it's blanked on me, Napa. Oh, uh, no, yeah, Napa. She's a Napa uh, chief of police now. Still lives in paradise half the time, but uh, she's she's chief of police in Napa. Very proud of her. Uh, it's hard to remain feminine when you're in this field where it calls upon you to do a lot of male-ish sort of things. And women cops often marry cops because uh, they can understand what they are doing. There can be a bit of narcissism in the field. <clears throat> now, not all cops are narcissistic. But they may have just good, healthy self-esteem. A narcissist has a big ego, thinks too highly of himself, is a legend in his own mind. That's partly true. Having studied this psychologically, narcissists ha actually have very small egos, tiny little things, almost non-existent. But as a compensation, they blow this enormous um, personality out to, uh, to protect that fragile inside. They expect special treatment. They may act grandiosity, uh, overestimate their own abilities, inflate their accomplishments, be boastful and pretentious, devalue others, and have a sense of entitlement. I'm not accusing all cops, just this is, this is something to watch for. Narcissists also have a very thin skin, can easily take offense, hold grudges, get even be very sensitive to criticism or failure. Everything has to go their way. And they're very subject to shame, as in all officers, but more so with a narcissist. They may ruminate and obsess on long overdue recognition, lack empathy, and may go into a narcissistic rage. Uh, narcissism comes either from overindulgence or abuse and neglect. Okay. Cops can be very idealistic. The altruism we spoke of in the first session where they go into cop work to change the world for the better. Um, that's an ideal. It's a wonderful one. Um, their negative experiences will rob the officer of that altruistic uh, hope. Those held on pedestals eventually fall off. And can suffer a traumatic de-idealization, become critical, angry, foolish, feel foolish for being, believing once in that altruistic ideal. So um, a good balance is what's needed, not one or the other. Cop will also tend to be a helper or rescuer type. I like that picture. They became an officer to help people, put bad guys away to protect society. Uh, and they have a soft heart for people who are in need and are generous. Their marriage can be sometimes a rescue project. That is, they'll pick up as a, as a spouse somebody who needs the kind of rescue that they provide, and that can be kind of difficult. 
being a rescuer appeals to narcissism. Shame. Shame versus guilt. I think we talked about this too. Guilt means you've done something wrong and that may be restored. You can be forgiven. Uh, you can change and then therefore you're no longer uh, guilty of this thing other than the fact that you did it once. But shame means I am bad. There's no restoration for me. There's no help for me. How do you change who and what you are? Uh, and shame is a very difficult thing. And it's something that cops can be prone to. It may be used for discipline to put shame on somebody. An internal affairs investigation can cause huge amounts of shame to go on an officer and stay on that officer for a lot longer than it is appropriate. Being subject to criminal investigations, can they can suffer shame even more and cause them to have a risk of suicide. Suicide for bringing shame on their profession. Suicide causing further shame on the profession. They may have a skewed view of the world as a result of the, the work they do. Sorry. They spend about 90% of their time with the worst 10% of our population. You know, in fact, you can imagine on your personality, on your outlook, uh, just on the way you talk to people can be quite stunning. Uh, and if you're with the, the lowest part of the, the, the humanity around you, it's tough. So everybody, everyone in your terminology becomes a dirtbag. Everyone lies. Everybody hides dirty secrets. No exceptions. Uh, get a very cynistic, uh, a great deal of cynicism. Nothing surprises them anymore. They can get a bleak, dark view. That's that skewed view of the world. Cops also, because they're protectors, will want to protect their own families. Their family must be protected at all costs. Uh, child care suspect over uh, protected or protective kids control issues uh, they will be very very difficult to please with regard to the way people treat their families if the family is victimized a cop is going to have a hard time coping with that uh, anybody does but uh, cops especially because they're supposed to be protectors they can be very emotionally defended. That meaning they must adopt emotional armor to survive the street. This is a needed skill, but it's hard to take it off. Uh, being emotionally armored means you're not available to deep compassion because you've got to hold yourself aloof from the situation and be in control of the scene and you can't get lost in it. Some can't get defended and they have to leave policing um, because this is a needed skill for them to survive it. It causes a numbness of feeling, a guardedness, even at home. So this is a, a difficult area. And sometimes it's the job of the chaplain to be there for the cop to be able to have a, a place where emotional safety allows them to blow off their esteem or to express their uh, humane side and not going to get judged for it because that's that's your job. Well, we sometimes have heard cops called pigs, but a cop carrying a pig is an unusual sight. Cops use gallows humor, black or sick humor, as an emotional defense. It's actually a sign of health. They've got to use this sort of device in order to keep themselves light and able to go out and face the horror. Mm -hmm. Such humor is not understood by the public. If you see that the public is getting to hear this on a microphone somewhere, uh, move the microphone away, unplug it, do something. Uh, the humor is reduced is to reduce horror. Um, if you go to the briefings before you go on ride alongs, so you're going to sit with the cops and they're going to be talking about former times and, and people they've contacted and the, um, the their opinion of this this or that person 
and you're, you're going to hear some pretty rough edge stuff. I mean, if you were sitting around a your um, your board at your church and they started to get up in a conversation like this, you'd put an end to it pretty quick because it's very uncharitable. Uh, it's it's usually laced with an awful, awful lot of f words, and um, you wouldn't you wouldn't participate in it. You don't have to participate in it in the police world but you do let it happen because they need to get their uh their nerves unjangled from the stuff they see okay they can be heavy teasers cops tease each other hard joust etc it's actually good natured a sign of affection somewhat uh it can have a hard edge on it too uh it can also be being mean-spirited and hostile uh, but there's given, there's take on the teasing stuff. And if they tease you, uh, count it good. I think that's probably, uh, if you take it well and you ride with it, okay, uh, they're going to like you uh, because you, you weren't, you didn't break because of this, uh, this kind of tough, tough jab that they gave you or sort of teasing thing. They generally really are going to like you and protect you like they protect their families. But um, if they tease a little bit, uh, tease them back. and um, But do it in a, a good way that doesn't shame them. Uh, keep, keep them uh, on top. Don't let the, they don't let the pain show. And as I said, they may take, tease the chaplains. Cops are action-oriented and risk-taking. And I wish, I hope that, photograph is photoshop but um because that would scare the bitch jesus <laughs> fright the heck out of me to do that they are high stimulus people it can be good that can be a good and a bad trait our police chief right now um billy is uh getting mm -hmm. over a very serious leg injury where he busted his leg all the pieces at, on a um a quad and he was just riding through some raw area and uh, came upon something that was uh, was unexpected and it threw him out of the unit. Uh, with this broken leg, bad broken leg, he still had to drive this thing back down like several miles to uh, to get treated. And it put him behind physically a lot. Unfortunately for him, it was not done on duty, but he's a salaried individual anyway. So, um, Cops, a lot of the injuries they, they suffer will happen off duty while they're doing one or another highly action oriented, exciting and dangerous pursuit. Um, and that happens, they're, they get hurt because they, they like the adrenaline and they work on it. Um, their action orientation is biological, that is in their environment, they learn this kind of risk taking and it feels good. It uh, it it is a high. They do high stimulus hobbies, as I said. They may feel urged to be doing something at all times. Cops, if if you look at a sleep cycle for an average police officer, uh, they are on for a good long time there because they have long shifts, like ten and a half, twelve hour shifts, for three or four days of the week, and then they have nothing for three or four days. Uh, so they lose a lot of sleep. They'll go home, but they'll get a small amount of sleep while they're on duty. And then they have their off duty time. And that's kind of high adrenaline continuous time that they had during their on duty time over. And they'll take a big crash and they'll have a lot of sleep. When they wake up, they are back to being Mr. Action, you know, the action figure somebody from marvel comics and they they're going to have to do something uh to take action is imperative um they might be adrenaline junkies and get bored easily that can cause them to try to stir up something or get something going or do something at least that's exciting and fun um in a crisis taking action is imperative and they see risk taking as courage and courage of course is a high value Courage, bravery is a very high virtue. Cowardice is despised forever. Uh, 
their courageousness may cause them to adopt foolhardiness to prove themselves brave. Uh, just be okay, concerned about that. Anger. Angry cops may seek a venue to act out their anger. It can be subtle and it can be unconscious. Uh, they may cause a fight. Make my day. I haven't seen that happen, but it could happen. There are such things as cop groupies. Power is seen as sexy. Cops are real men. They got uniforms on. They're strong. They're decisive. They're commanding. Uh, they're just like the guys you see on television. Lots of opportunities for groupies, worship, extramarital relationships. And it happens. Cops can fall to immorality because the uh, what's offered out there for them can be very enticing. Um, actual power and virtue may be lacking, and the other becomes a and the other becomes disillusioned when they find out that this action figure is not such a hero. Uh, that can be difficult, and it can lead to shame, which is poison. They also suffer a great deal of peer pressure. Law enforcement is like a tribe or a fraternity, a legal gang. There's a great pressure to conform, to belong, to be accepted, and the peer pressure enforces it. Loyalty to the tribe is expected. Loyalty can be blind, and it can cause, as I mentioned before, the code of silence, which keeps you from commenting on your brother officer's performance or lack of it. Domestic violence is law enforcement's dirty little secret. It stems from dominance and control, which is inbred in their nature, in their work, and they may have brought it to their work scene. Uh, cycles of domestic abuse can happen. If you've ever studied this, it's kind of like a circle going around and around where the uh, incident of abuse and violence happens at the top of the circle. Then it goes around clockwise into a, a deep shame period where uh, lots Lots of effort is put to restore the relationship and to reestablish trust and, and I'll do anything for you, honey. And uh, uh, I was wrong, but I, I see that now. I'm a good guy. Please love me again. And then when it's restored, uh, the pressure builds up toward another event. That's just a kind of a mental sickness. And uh, so it's a really important thing that uh, domestic abuse does not get carried out too far. The firearm laws um, are such in our state and maybe is appropriate that when somebody commits a, a, a felonious level of domestic violence, uh, they cannot own and operate a, a weapon, uh, a gun. Uh, this for a police officer means the end of his work, work life because he can no longer carry a gun. He can't be a police officer anymore. And so it's a threat to his profession, to his job. Uh, I don't know what that last line means. That wants to comment on it. The situation may call for an arrest of a fellow officer. That is a very hard thing. Very difficult to do. It violates the sense of family of the core. And so it um, it's something you, you, you don't want to ever have seen among officers. Officers suffer trauma, I would expect that my wife is a mental health professional and she says she believes that just about every pol police officer, by the time they have been in the force for any length of time, they suffer PTSD. A critical incident that bothers an officer doesn't go away. Uh, they wanna shake it off and get past it. That's why all the drinking used to take place a lot more because uh, it tended to blot that out. But it doesn't go away, uh, not for all, all people. It appears to be personally centered, not even uh, not event centered, uh, the trauma. So it's about me. It's not about what happened that I took part in. Uh, so this gets this gets embedded in the personality. Cops will have several traumas in, the, in their career. Uh, incidents where they might dream about it later, they might mull over it it may prey upon their minds or it may be called up due, due to similar circumstances occurring later on 
the illusion of being in control is just broken uh, and it can have effects on your spouse and your kids and community. Uh, I'm not sure what that's saying. Anyway, effects on your spouse and your kids. The prosecutor may be evaluating the cop's actions uh, so the trauma can come from the potential of being accused of a crime. All right. The cop may get sued, in other words. When he's returned to work, he may have similar calls and he may want to avoid the scene that looks a lot like the trauma scene that he's still suffering from. Indirect effects of trauma, maybe irritation, withdrawal, acting out, alcohol abuse, and loss of family relations, withdrawal from uh, families. And no one may understand what's going on, but trauma is a real thing. It's not a, doesn't say you're a bad person. Post-traumatic stress syndrome can be the normal reaction of a normal person to abnormal incidents. So it's no judgment that, uh, that suddenly you whip around every time some car backfires. Alcohol use and abuse. It's common. It's even condoned. Uh, the use is seen as being macho, peer pressure to conform, to be initiated. Uh, the problem drinkers are known by command and by each other. And there may be uh, enabling, that is, people helping them or covering for them or hiding for them their problem and therefore killing them with kindness. Not a good thing. Divorce can happen uh, in a police force. I've, I've known several cops who've been divorced uh, while in office. The chaplain's role in that may or may not be something we're called into, but it's something we're gonna be available to. Uh, divorces are hard and uh, we may disapprove of them uh, because it's not God's way. And Jesus said, you know, he wasn't in favor of it, but uh, we're not there to, to bring God's judgment on situations. We're there to help the people who are going through their life crises. Um, multiple marriages are commonplace in policing. As I think I said, it's the second most likely, maybe I said, second profession uh, for of all professions in terms of divorces percentage-wise. Uh, number one, I think, is a, is, a, is a tie between truck drivers and rock stars <laughs> and, then, and then cops. Um, extramarital relationships can happen quite often. And uh, sometimes, you know, this happens in other kinds of work. Um, there can be a relationship with somebody who is in the police force because that person understands you more than your wife does or your husband. And therefore, um, an alliance is drawn and sometimes it draws itself into a romantic relationship. Uh, policing is so different than the rest of the world that uh, there can be an alienation from one's own wife or husband because of what you do. The chaplain's role, to give easy access to somebody who may have some help or can, at least it can be a good listener. Life does not have to be like this can be a message that we carry with us. We can help an officer to understand what is happening, give new perspective. Uh, we're not there to lecture anybody or necessarily to give them our morals, but keep two things in balance, get, getting the job done, considering people. An emphasis in law enforcement is the job in church, it's the people. So uh, that, that doesn't have to be like that. Uh, People are an awful, awful important component of law enforcement work. Uh, in lower ranks, let, have less people skills and less people skill requirements, but more is better. In the higher ranks, the more people skills are required, and especially management skills among many people is important. We bring a humanizing and divine presence to what is a really harsh profession. All right. 
Are there any questions, brothers, from any of you? Got it. No questions, Peter, but that was that was really great. That was, uh, lots of things I had never even thought about. Good, 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 good. Wonderful. I'm happy to hear it. Uh, as I said, I spent three whole days with um, the Michigan State Police uh, Patrol. They're an interesting bunch. They they have um, you know a typical cop car, at least at that time. That was back when everybody was driving Crown Vicks. But they didn't have a light bar on the top of the unit. They had a, what they called uh, like a gumball thing. It was, it was a huge, tall glass dome. It was probably a foot or foot and a half high that had a, uh, a red um, whirly gig sort of light that, that spun very quickly and, and flashed down the highway. <clears throat> they claimed they could be seen for 10 miles with those things. And they preferred those to the light bars. Um, Michigan being what it is, it, they really prize themselves in their knowledge of cars because they are the, they have Detroit and they have the, the, their car state, their automobile industry. Everything they talk about is cars. And um, they prided themselves to have the number one uh, vehicle safety and training school in the nation now the chp would differ with that we've got we've got a few more miles of roads in in california but michigan is a bigger state than you might think and it's and it is a long state and it has great distances and lansing which is the capital is down in the south western corner of it where if they get called into one of the northern reaches they're going to have hundreds of miles to cover in a hurry and this one state operation did a lot of their higher crime situation so they would have to get in one of those cars and and hit hit the floor with the pedal and uh and just drive like maniacs 120 140 miles an hour and get where they're going with those those that gumball spinning on the top of the <laughs> uh pretty interesting work that they did well anyway they had, they had this whole section of the state police that was their psychology section who would deal with the cops minds and and those who might be going through problems uh they helped them out so pretty interesting work uh one day we looked at cop psychology one day we looked at, at alcohol and drug abuse and then one day we looked at um cop suicide and why and kind of really dissected it so um it it doesn't cause us to have any judgment on cops it it rather gives us a lot of compassion and understanding that they're living in a very, very tough environment, uh, and they and they've got. So while we are out there ministering to the needs of the pub public uh, through the cops and wearing the uniform, uh, we're also watching our cops and seeing how they're doing. And our relationship with them may not be overtly ministerial, but it is inevitably so, and it's important. Uh, and they they. They will glean from it all that they can. They really do appreciate their chaplains. Have you found that to be so, Danny or Rick? Uh, those guys express their appreciation that you're there, kind of more than you expect. Um, I think you know, as we're just kind of spinning ours up. Um, I think there are what I found in the last couple of weeks. I've gone on a ride along, got on a couple of calls. I think they're kind of surprised, you know, like, oh, this is a good thing. Um, but but very appreciative i think oh good that's yeah good. that's what i found the same also yeah yeah and you, know, you know we got five chaplains and we we're fairly new in the chaplaincy you know with that many mm -hmm. but uh it seems that there's a good team of chaplains and everybody everybody likes them and when they started your unit, I remember because the um, Sheriff McKenzie showed me his his protocol and he had him fill out a uh, an application for the chaplaincy that was like a thin telephone book full of I mean, just tons of stuff and then put them under lie detector. I mean, it was kind of over the top. We all looked at them and said, what are you thinking? You know, nobody wants to go through all that. I hope it wasn't so arduous when you were introduced into it. No, I just I had a lot of paperwork. 
And then uh, I had one of the search and rescue guys. His name was Dick, super guy. I got to be real good friends with him and trained with him on a couple things and uh, just went through a lot of stuff, came to the house, uh, went to all the friends that I'd put down, you know, and I mean, they, they really, a real they really, they really did the background and yeah. Well, know. that was kind of what Scott McKenzie was trying to get. He wanted to have the chaplains to be at least as qualified as his officers were. And I, and I thought, man, uh, that yeah, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they, 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 they didn't, they turned over every rock, you know, and he wanted to get four years of uh, college on, on all of his chaplains. I don't know if you requ they required that still. No, they didn't do that with me. Well, I think they That's had us. to learn that because in the county, you're not talking about, you know, Chico is, of course, the city with the largest population. It's got the most educated pastors and, you know, will have had college degrees, but we didn't require that. But he was yeah. gonna, he was going to be searching from all the small towns and hinterlands and everything else for the for the county because it would exclude that Chico population. And I thought, you know, if you if you nix out everybody who doesn't have a four year degree, you're going to lose a lot of capable people who are re rare and go, but you just made it impossible for them to join you. Yeah, so I, well, I think I, a lot of it was was my business because I've been in business for thirty years and then pastoring for over 20 at that time yeah so you know they looked at that and then i'll then i was just a hometown guy he's been here most of my life yeah yeah great awesome okay anybody need a two minute break and i'll i'll reel up the, the second one which is on ride alongs and uh let me see here i'm gonna pause okay here we are <clears throat> okay, back again. Class 14 is Ride Along Procedures and Crime Scene Integrity. Um, I think that, and this is the one class that I think everybody acknowledges in the ICPC ought to be added to the basic 12. Rather important. I don't know if you all noticed, but the badge that I'm wearing today is, is a new badge, but it's, it's old school, kind of like a Wild West badge that the Chico PD is putting on as their normal new uh badge style this one that you see in the picture is the one that has been for several years it has a seal of california in the middle of it and then uh the police officer stuff around it now not all of you have a seven point badge uh i believe uh mm -hmm. county police uh, county sheriffs have a different shape or at least i think so maybe maybe not do you have a seven pointed badge and in, in you do in butte county don't you uh i'm not i think ours is a i think ours is a five it's a five okay and there's a shield type that can be there too as well uh okay so ride alongs uh i think this is a very essential part of our work as chaplains and it cannot be overlooked it should be done as much often as we can to get in the car with a cop and drive around with them it's also something a little daunting to think about for us pastors who have never uh, stepped into this world before, and it can be a little bit weird, uh, get over that because this is where the rubber hits the road. Um, generally speaking, you're going to want time with all the officers it, that you can ride with so they get to know you and they get to trust you, that they feel that in a situation in the field, they can believe that you're there for a good reason and that they can let you in. Uh, on what's happening. Uh, once you went over their trust and um, ability to trust you, it's it's really solid gold. And it's a very important piece of what we do. Anyway, riding along with an officer is both a privilege and a tremendous opportunity. Your ministry really be begins here and the chaplaincy begins in the right seat of these cars. If you participate with them in their world, They'll come to know you and to call upon you when they have a real need later on. We're not there immediately to minister to them, grace or whatever. We're there to just show them uh, we like them. We're from the outside world, but we're coming inside. We've been qualified and trained so we can do it. And we're not going to screw things up in the field so that they, they have to get rid of us. If you wait for a special call out only when you're called out to a death notification or a 
uh, dead body. You may serve in a limited manner, but uh, they don't know you. And so they'll let you do a chaplain thing and talk to the people who are over there crying. But uh, there may be something more to do. Deeper work with the police themselves may be held back and you may wait for that forever. No one calls you if they don't already know you. So the ride along is, uh, is the entry door level. Now note, uh, ride with your own department for training. No need to obtain clearance and for your own future chaplaincy, you're gonna need to go through fingerprinting, live scan at the, ch at the police station, at your own department, have a background check run, do applications, whatever your own chaplaincy requires. With the Chico PD, we have a separate uh, corporation that we formed for the Chico Police Chaplaincy, which uh, is a it's its own 501c3. We went through all that and qualified it. We have our own banking, um, and we get funded by the police department by officers' uh, voluntary contributions. It's a payroll deduction thing, and they send it to the city uh, in the payroll packages, and the city cuts the chaplaincy a separate check. So we work in line with them. We're under their uh, authority at all times. We'll receive chaplains as long as the chief approves them. Uh, and, and then we work within the rules of the department. So it is a separate organization, but it's completely dependent upon and satellite to the Chico PD. Um, and that works out for us very well. But so we go through their fingerprinting and background check that they run through uh, to approve our people. Now that's a good part of the original Chico Police Department chaplaincy and our uniforms uh, were, looked like that at the time. They're different now a little bit, but that's us uh, one of the squad cars. I'm not gonna um, go through all the clothing. You all have different clothing requirements and in the paperwork that I provided for you, you've got all this information. Uh, when you go out and ride along, you may want to bring money for coffee for you and your officer. You're going to find most cops, uh, at least I know the Chico PD, will not allow you to pay for anything uh, because they they will not um, be, be subject to the scrutiny that they may get that they're receiving any gratuities from anybody, not even the chaplain. But be willing to, to come along with uh, coffee money if you want. And you always tip when you're in a situation like that and you do not ask for a discount, especially for cops. Cops will likely refuse, but you can offer anyway. Uh, that's the difficulty with cops going through In-N-Out Burger because In-N-Out Burger has a corporate-wide policy to cut 50% off of any police officer in uniforms uh, order. Well, our Chico PD don't, uh, don't allow that they accept that discount. And it's a conflict at the uh, at the window because they can't receive that discount, and the people inside can't not offer it. Anyway, when you're in training, you don't need a uniform, but you can wear sh shoes that to walk in to run and get through rough terrain. Wear long pants, a comfortable shirt, etc. I know it can be hot, but shorts just don't get it uh, in cop cars. Um, you'll probably not get out of the car during stops or interviews as long as you're just a citizen rider. Um, if you have a trainee ID or whatever like that, you can wear it as you go through. I'm talking about pre chaplains and most of you are already cleared in your departments and are getting uniformed and into it. So these things wouldn't pertain to you. Uh, some ride along procedures. Initiating a ride along while in training that is before you're actually inducted into the chaplaincy. Prior to the ride, you will want to inform the on-call supervisor, the sergeant for that unit, that you're going on a ride along. You've been cleared. Uh, however it is your department has you sign a waiver or something like that, that they know that you're riding on your own discretion and uh, that, you know, liabilities are things that they have to consider. Uh, you do this through the uh, chaplaincy liaison or by direct phone call to the supervisor on the phone system, voicemail, in any case, uh, or leave a message. 
Uh, so you are prearrange this right along if you're in training uh, so that you show up at the hour specified and leave your phone numbers so he or she can contact you ahead of time with a specially scheduled ride. Now, that is, if a citizen rider may get a couple of hours of ride that they specify, and that's going to be about it, uh, that's kind of standard. Once you become uniformed and you're in and among them, you can ride for as long as they let you. And it's usually going to be at least a half a half a shift or a whole shift. So that when you are a chaplain, uh, the prearranging is best um, for the ride. But you can just show up at the briefing, whenever that is, in our Chico PD. Uh, the briefings for Monday through Thursday are at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, or about 7.15, and they go till 8 when they go on, they go out on duty. Uh, so as a typical thing, I'll come in on a, a Thursday. <clears throat> I will go at seven o'clock into the briefing room and wait for the cops to all show up, greet them and, and be among them. <clears throat> and then they go through their briefing. They go through um, what's gone on in the last 24 hours, what's still in the books. Uh, maybe they're looking for a car or a person. And uh, we'll talk about things that have happened recently. They may show videos that are going around for training uh, and you'll get your assignment as to what officer is going to give you the ride. You may make special arrangements uh, with a particular officer at your request or his or hers. Uh, so with clearing that through the supervisor, Officer Jones here has asked, asked if I'll ride with her and uh, I've agreed, so it's arranged. And that usually is going to pass. Be in uniform with proper ID and all the things above and promptness, of course, is vital. Don't show up late. Things to know and to do on your ride along with any police unit to give you their your chaplain's name and number. I'm chaplain number seven in our chaplaincy. It's also good to know some of the 10 codes. We're going to talk about that when we get to the end. 10 codes are just sort of shorthand. To find out and remember the badge number of your officer. Now that's very important. If you're riding with 54, that's the way it's going to come over on the radio. The police radios will never say the officer's names. So if you hear Ch uh, Chico 54 uh, or 54 Chico uh, on the radio, you know that your officer is going to have to stop listening to you and start listening to the radio, and that this is a call out. So. Um, you, you stay attuned to the badge number. You tell dispatch before you go on the ride that you're going on a ride with badge number 54. Uh, that's I always do that after the briefing has ended and they're all getting their stuff together to jump in the cars. I'll go into dispatch and say, hello dispatch, I'm Chaplain 7, I'm going on a ride with 54. And they thank me for that because they want to know where all the bodies are. They're going to want to know that you're there. They knew where 54 was and what car he's in but uh, he, they didn't know that I'm going to be riding with them. And they don't always call in. I've got a citizen rider. Whenever the radio is giving information in the cars, always be quiet. Let a conversation die for a moment before you pick it up again because they need to hear what's going on. Try to know where you are at all times, yeah. the street names, the major landmarks. It's, it's easy to get lost in that because you're not driving. And you can just sort of enjoy the ride. But if something happens and you got to get on the radio and say, officer down or, uh, you know, we're, we're at the corner of, I don't know, somewhere near that. It's a, there's a red building here. You know, that's not going to help much for them to find you. Listen to the scanner, the, uh, the radio to know what's happening around you. Learn how to operate the equipment inside the police unit, the radio. The long gun release gun use uh, is uh, the long run release gun is a very important thing to learn. I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, how to hit the sirens at least make make sound and to use the spotlights which are on the posts at either side of your uh, windshield. Now the gun releases is, is uh, the thing. There's one or two long guns in all police units. Uh, at least up to now, and I believe they've kind of dispensed with the 
uh, shotgun, at least I've heard that. They have a carbine and a, and a shotgun very often. And those are two of them right now mounted between the two front seats. And you can see the sort of the bar that is up on the top. That's a magnetic gun uh, clamp that holds those things steady in there. They cannot be taken out of there by some crazy bad guy. But you've got to know how to un get them out of there if you're going to be along with a cop and need to assist that cop in defense. Before you in the console between the seats also will be something looking all kind of like this, an array of buttons that you can see there, uh, wail, yelp, uh, and so forth. There, those are some of the siren sounds that you can get if you press those buttons. Look out, you're going to hear a lot of uh, sounds. Um, full right, full left, both ways, kind of uh, light bar signals. Now in the, um, and I'll say this for, for just you all, in the in our units, they have a, uh, a button in the middle of that that says alarm. If you press alarm, it will release the guns. Uh, they figured that anybody who gets into a cop car and is not supposed to know how to release the guns is not going to press a button that called alarm. So uh, that's something for you to know. Okay. Be prepared to help the police officer in any situation. Cover your officer, keeping a 360 degree watch while he or she does his or her job. And after each ride or special call out, note your hours in your own records. Uh, you can keep these records if you wish. I, I would at least put a notation on my cell phone that I was out with officer so-and-so, so I can turn in those hours later to my department uh, as we gather them together in the chaplaincy. You'll turn in your hours quarterly, at least we do for Chico. And we need to break, that, break it down by type of service with notations like a death notification or ride, ride along or something. And be very alert. Most officer involved shootings take place in three to five seconds. Now, when we're out on ride alongs, we, we are not there to be a cop, a second cop. We're there to help them and we're there to be, offer physical support as necessary, but your officer does not need a second cop in the cab he needs a chaplain but don't be religious be a chaplain chaplain doesn't have to go there and flap a big black bible on the dashboard and said how are you and jesus that's not the job don't initiate religious conversation if and when the officer does so that's fine take it as far as he or she wants to go with it but you're not there to in inject into the situation spirituality if you can't improve on silence, once again, don't. Do not breach the confidentiality of your conversations, even though it's not a confidential communication. What you talked about is between you and he or she, unless it's something that they would very much want to be heard on. But uh, it's better just to keep it quiet. Follow the instructions of the officer to the letter. Then it's on them if they're putting you in the wrong place. But you must uh, obey this because they are going to count on you being in that position and you need to do that uh, you need to assist the officer in any appropriate manner in domestic disputes particularly um, very often it's it's important to be able to stand with one of the two disputants just about always dv calls uh will get two officers there before they go in so they can stand with and cover both parties who are at opposition with each other uh, an awful lot of officers in fact right ranking right up there with traffic stops traffic stops and domestic violence uh, situations are the two cases in which officers get killed more often than anything else uh, that's because when an officer comes in and arrests the the guy say in a domestic violence dispute the woman has called the cops she sees her husband or her boyfriend going out in handcuffs. She suddenly lost her bread breadwinner and uh, she just wanted to scare him or get him to stop beating on her, but she wasn't looking to have him arrested. She sees the gun that he was hiding behind the sofa or something and she gets it out and shoots the cop in the back. 
that's a, a scenario that they don't want to have repeated any anymore ever again. So cops go out in pairs when they go to DV calls so that they're covering both people and they're watching both people as they continue on uh, doing the law enforcement. Uh, when they're taking suspects into custody, et cetera, uh, we assist the officers as well. You may do a hands-on with some people who need to be kept in a place where they are. I always wear with me a, a pair of leather gloves that uh, I'll put on when I have to have contact with individuals. So I'm not contacting their stuff. Um, we may or may not enter into a search. If you're quite sure what you're doing, you can do so like a, somebody's backpack. Uh, guys' backpacks sometimes can be so full of stuff and it might be have some sharps in there, some needles. So be careful if you're assisting the officer on that. Okay. Do not disturb or contaminate a crime scene. Be exactly where you're told to be. It's better to be a live witness than a dead hero. It's a good motto to live by. Do not assist in the cleanup or removal of any hazardous or biohazardous materials. You don't have to touch of blood, okay? Don't do it. It's infected very often. No chaplain is to be involved in the cleanup of any blood or residual body fluids. If the officer doesn't seem to want you to be with him or her, just be as cordial and helpful as you can be. Uh, I had a couple of female officers that I'd ride with early on, and it seemed like they didn't like to be assigned to this. They were uncomfortable with me in the car. But I learned something. Very often, female officers have animals, horses, dogs, cats, God knows what. Uh, when I would find out, you have any animals? Oh, yeah, I got three horses and I got two dogs and I got my cat and so forth. Oh, well, what are the, what's the name of your horses? Hey, you're off to the races now. You can flip that relationship around 180 degrees in a second. Uh, so use that one. Um, if the officer behaves in a reckless manner, you can ask the officer to return you to the station immediately. Both of you are at risk. This request alone will probably get his or her attention. You don't have to tell them why, uh, but you can just say, hey, I, I need to get back to the station. Can you go 1019? And they will do it uh, if you feel threatened by what they're having you be involved in. If the officer commits a criminal act, now this has never happened to me, but you are to contact the senior chaplain or the liaison as soon as possible. Ask for instructions therein. If neither is available, ask for the watch commander who will be a lieutenant, lieutenant level. If the officer tells you to get the shotgun, be prepared to use it. Note, you must contact the chaplain liaison immediately after the incident and make a report if you have to put hands on a gun. Again, I've never had to do that. I always like the idea of the shotgun more than the carbine because um, it ought to be real that racking a shotgun is going to get a bad guy's attention in a hurry. And then saying something tough like, you know, that Clint Eastwood would say, um, you want to make my day punk rack rack. Uh, it's probably going to get their attention. Anyway, at the end of the ride, we say to the officer, thank you for the ride. Sure, appreciate it. And then go back to dispatch to inform that you're no longer on the ride with badge number 54. You're off the uh, off there. And be prepared at the next chaplain meeting to just relate the fact that you were on a ride along with Joe Blow and uh, he had a good ride. He saw some dead bodies. He did this, that, and the other. Okay. Along with these, this... Um, going along on the ride-alongs, I want to cover some crime scene integrity issues because we will be on crime scenes and we need to understand what to do and what not to do. The possible types of crime scenes we may be involved with, of course, with murder. I have not, well, yes, yeah, sure, I have been. Uh, the Inskip uh, triple killing was the, mur the murder by, by one suspect. I've been on a scene. I haven't, I wasn't inside the, the building. Uh, suicide, I certainly, I certainly have been on several of those. 
deaths by unknown means, lots and lots of those. Very often, uh, pharmaceutical deaths, uh, kidnappings, uh, sexual assaults, domestic disputes, traffic accidents, drug busts, home or commercial robberies, accidental deaths, vehicle burglaries or break-ins, vandalism and graffiti. So these are the typical kind of domestic crimes and personal crimes that we are going to be involved in and go on these kinds of crime scenes. Understand a perimeter. There can be two perimeters, an outer and an inner perimeter. The area surrounding an area where a crime has been committed is the outer uh, perimeter. The inner perimeter would be the immediate area around the crime scene itself, the outer perimeter area surrounding the inner one. Uh, the perimeter has to do with letting people in and or forbidding people to get in. Perimeters are normally established and marked with yellow crime scene tape. In the case of a shooting, you can expect that the outer perimeter to be quite large since the spent ammunition uh, and shells have to be accounted for and they have to be found. So they don't want people traipsing all over their precious evident gathering scene. Evidence is anything at the scene of a crime that can be used to solve the crime or lead to the conviction of the per perpetrator of the crime. It may be dust, hair, threads, footprints, fingerprints, papers, and their exact arrangement as well, or anything at all. Uh, chain, of course, uh, yeah. So chain of event of evidence is the trail that carries a piece of evidence from the scene of the crime to the courtroom and trial. Every person along that trail must account for the evidence while it is in his or her possession. If you pick something up, you must be a part of the chain of evidence that is, if that evidence is evidence that do not touch or pick up anything at a crime scene, unless you are directed by the officer. Don't pick it up, don't touch it, don't get involved with it. Uh, you'll find that in your department, the evidence is brought in by the officer, bagged or in some way contained and marked. And then with special marking and the, and the uh, file number on that crime, it's put usually through a, a series of doors that lock behind him and don't allow him to get back into it unless he checks it out again officially by the evidence uh, locker official. So that keeps the trail of evidence possession clear. When that's messed up, if somebody can get in on that evidence and monkey with it or touch it or have anything to do with it, if there's any lacking of the assurance of the purity of that evidence, it's lost to the trial. And so we just have to stay real conscious of that. Now at a crime scene, there will be an incident commander uh, especially a, a, an involved or high level crime. That person is in charge of the action at the scene. This may be the responding officer, that's lower level, the sergeant who arrives later, or the person of higher rank that assumes responsibility for the crime scene later on, a lieutenant level or a captain. It can also be the crime scene investigator or crime scene technician while they're investigating the scene. Crime scene search is a group of highly trained technicians who gather evidence, prepare it for storage, cataloging, and filing for others to review in preparing the case for trial and presentation of the trial. Cases are won and lost based on the efficiency and completeness of the work of the crime scene technician. Now, our current president in, in the Chico PD chaplaincy, Bud Chauvin, uh, also serves with the FBI as a, as a chaplain. He had a special FBI friend here locally. Uh, so he got involved in that. And he was called to serve as a chaplain on scene at the Mandalay Bay, uh, Las Vegas shooting scene, where if you'll remember a few years ago, some guy went up there with an arsenal of, of high uh, velocity, high output uh, machine gun stuff and was just massacring people down in a plaza from the Mandalay Bay Hotel window that he shot out the window and started killing people. Well, you imagine the shells that were ex that were all over the floor and the uh, number of shells, a uh, number of 
projectiles that hit that that um, plaza. Uh, everything had to be mapped out. Everything had to be found. Uh, it was ma it was massive, and the FBI agents had to take it over and do a careful, carefully prepared crime scene report from that. That's brought the worst to one that I've ever heard of. With regard to the media, person or persons who are part of the working press are the media. They may be from the newspaper and the radio or television stations or from publications in the area. They have an agenda, which is gathering information and facts for publications, and they really like to have things be sensational. Be friendly, but don't be informative. The CNET supervisor or the department media representative are the only persons authorized to give information to the media. Do not even tell them what you are doing at the scene. You can give confidentiality as the reason for your silence if you wish. Remember the slogan from World War II, loose lips sink ships. In our case, loose lips could sink the ministry of the chaplain's corps altogether. So we just don't say anything to media. I don't mind being interviewed uh, and I can carry off a good interview, but our rules prevail and, and it's not a good thing to be. We really can't add anything to what the department provides. And there are some things that we may know that will be part of their policy not to disclose that to media. And how do we know that's the case? Just don't talk to the media. Okay. Chaplain at the scene. We can help or we can hinder the process of the crime scene by our actions. If we disturb evidence, pollute the scene, make the crime scene specialty team work harder, we can be the cause of the criminal getting off when prosecution could have occurred. This could cause the department to look critically at the work of the chaplains. Remember the main reason O.J. Simpson was not convicted in criminal court was improper handling of evidence by the police department, that special glove that threw the doubt. You will usually arrive at the crime scenes in one of two ways. You are riding with an officer and during the ride, you will be sent to a location where a crime may have occurred. You can pollute a scene before you know that a crime has come, happened. Extra footprints, fingerprints, handprints, etc., make the work of the crime scene staff much more difficult if not impossible, so be careful. If in any doubt, stay clear of the area. When the yellow tape is put up, respect it, understand what it's there for. When you're called to the scene, either by communications or supervisor or another chaplain, you will be approaching a scene where the crime has been committed. Don't cross the outer or inner perimeter unless you've got permission from the scene su supervisor. Most of our work will take place outside the yellow tapes. When called to go inside either outer or inner perimeters, remember you are on holy ground. Spent ammunition, matchbooks, buttons, threads, blood drops, etc., are all important right where they are. If they're moved, they may be useless. So be careful about going in to a crime scene. When called to the scene, you are not an emergency responder. Do not drive code three, that means really fast, to get there. Chaplains drive their own vehicles sometimes and provide their own insurance. An accident could be very costly. It could damage the chaplain program as well as your car, a body or a life. Chaplains don't use red or blue lights on their personal vehicles and they don't run red lights responding to calls out to criminal scenes. I think I've made my point. Anyway, don't be a hot shot. Just get there safely. If you have any reason to believe that you will come in contact with blood at the crime scene, carry a pair of latex gloves or get some from someone else from in your pocket or somewhere on your person. It's good to carry those with you. Or as I say, if you can borrow them from somebody, uh, very often officers will have them in the trunk. It's too late after contact to find out that the blood was infected with HIV or some other contaminant or disease. Remember, our mission as police chaplains is a spiritual one. We're not auxiliary police officers or crime scene technicians. We don't know what we're doing there. So uh, measure out the situation 
and know what you're doing. Now, let's take some typical scenarios. Obviously, a death notification isn't going to be a crime scene. You're going to someplace to let the person know that their relative died generally in a, another area, another county. So there's nothing to worry about in terms of that. And 1144 or dead body uh, cause not yet to be determined. It means somebody died in a home usually, uh, very often in bed or on the sofa. Uh, and they are there. Uh, they're in a kind of a controlled area. They won't spray tape necessarily around, but you'll find out where the body is and you'll clarify with the officers uh, what you can do and what you can't do. If they're not considering it a crime, but just an overdose or something like that, there isn't a lot of security. But the body is in one place where a concerned effort to gather up all the pharmaceuticals is going to be held. They're going to be looking for drugs and be able to gather them together so that they don't get into anybody else's hands. That's particularly the, the role of the county sheriff's office uh, when the chief of police or other police have made the call in city, they turn it over to the sheriffs who are the coroners, deputy coroners, and handle the aftermath of a dead body. Um, crime scenes that are critical like murders or robberies, we're not gonna get chaplains out to them very often. Um, our, there was, however, once here in Chico, a, um, a credit, um, uh, what do you call it? <clears throat> um, like a bank anyway, um, credit union. credit union, credit union. That was what I was looking for. Thank you. Credit union here, not too far from my church. Uh, and they had been burglarized, uh, robbed and somebody came in there was walking around, was casing the joint out, being real nervous, got them all nervous, then whipped out a gun and got a bag full of money from the credit union and walked out. So we came afterwards uh, and they, they were looking for a chaplain to come in there and just be available to the bank people who had had a gun drawn on them and had money stolen. And I thought it was a very valuable time for a little while just to talk to all of them, see how they're doing and to help them kind of ratchet down their alarm uh, that they had suffered in. Um, there was no real evidence gathering much, except I'm sure they, they were getting the, the cameras and all of that stuff, but that wasn't something I would interfere with anyway. Um, but there are some, scenes which you'll go into where there'll be crime scenes strung around um they don't want the public in there they're still gauging what had happened and you just get permission to find out where you're allowed to go and where you're not we generally are going to be outside the tape uh but we can go in uh if you got a vips program or the or the stars program for the uh sheriff's department uh they'll often deal with stuff out on the site around the perimeter outside the perimeters and the chaplains can go in very often because they want us in where the uh, the law enforcement stuff is going on so you just gauge it by what you're told and you'll figure out your role but um ask first is a, is a good motto before you step in and pick anything up okay i mentioned the 10 codes these 10 codes is used in california or more are most often used um, I don't know all these and I don't have to use them all, but 10-8 is, is a very commonly used one. You'll hear that and you'll go, what's 10-8? Well, it means the police officer is done with the, the current call. I'm all done here. I got all my stuff done. I, I figured out I can't do any more here. And dispatch, I'm available for assignment. 10-8 uh, means back in service, available for assignment. So um, if you were a chaplain called to do a death notification, you stay with a family beyond when the officer is there, and then you call in uh, to say, uh, I'm no longer needed here. I'm no longer at the residence. Uh, I'm back off, off of duty. Uh, you'll call the dispatch and say, I'm, this is Chaplain 7. I'm done with this uh, death notification, and I'm 10-8. 
that just means I'm back in service, available for reassignment. Okay. 1019 uh, is a return to station. That is you're driving around, but we're, we'll, your officer will sometimes call in. Uh, I'm going to be 1019, and that means I'm returning to the station. Maybe so he can get he can drop you off, or maybe so that he can get his lunch. 10 for 1144. I've mentioned that a couple of times. It, it means the dead body cause of death not yet established. Uh, and that's going to be often a call that you will go on because um, you need a chaplain there because the dead body was discovered by the person's relatives or neighbors or roommates. There is also uh, to do with um, code, very seldom used also, but 10-3 means emergency and get there as fast as possible. Lights and sirens involved. And code four means no further assistance needed. Code four is back to normal. And the other ones are not used very often uh, that I, in my experience. All right, questions, anybody? Hey, Peter, oh. are the codes common across different law enforcement agencies, sheriff and PD and all that? Yeah, I'd say here in Butte County and Glenn County, they're all going to be using the same language. But cops have been going more and more to common language, normal speech, uh, rather than all this code stuff. Uh, just say it simply, uh, whatever you're going to say. So you don't have to know codes, but it's but if you want to recognize what's what you're hearing, these are the codes I hear most often. I don't know, Mark, do you remember any other codes that are often used? Um. Yeah, we a lot of times we would use the 11 codes. Uh, the, that's a different set of codes that, that uh, like the 1144, right. um, that would be used and in, in things along those lines. But yeah, you're right. Most of them are starting to get back to uh, plain English type uh, type codes. Uh, there are a few different ones. The, the code 999 um, for us, we always used 1199, uh, but that would that would be a, just a different one there. So. And that's what? Uh, basic officer needs help. That's yeah, officer down. That's that's yeah. that's yeah. That's code black. That's that's uh, everything everything let, lets loose at once. If yeah. that gets put out over the radio, you're probably gonna get everybody in the entire county and sometimes from out of the county coming on on to uh, to help. Right. Right. That's what I, I wanted to say that. That's right. Um and I'm, I didn't mention, but yeah, 10 4, you remember that from the old C citizen bad days when 10 4, good buddy. You know, <laughs> that, that That is one of the 10 codes. It means uh, I heard you loud and clear or something to that nature or agreed or confirmed or something like that. 10 4, uh, message received. 10 4. Uh, Butte County, our 10 19 is a 10 10. Okay, that's that's going back to the station. Yeah. 10, 10. Okay. Yeah. So it's not going to always be the same, but you just learn your own inner language. But uh, as Mark agreed, uh, just straight English is usually all it's used anymore all the time, except for these couple of things. Billy, you put your hand up. I can't hear you yet. You're, you're not. You're not. You're squelched unmute yourself. Wait, there's someone out the window there you go <laughs> oh okay you're you're making another gesture okay uh ride-alongs are very important and it's good to go uh good to go as often as you can i'd say we we try to do it at least uh as many hours as, as would make a, a police officer shift per month you can break that up into one or two rides or three rides if you wanted to do it. I like to go on Thursday mornings, typically because it's not a, lo a high load time. Uh, if you go out on Friday night, you're gonna just see a lot of drunks and your officer is gonna be in and out of the car looking at drunks. You're not gonna be spending a lot of time talking about life. Um, but I go at a low load time so I can have some time with the officer and uh, we can get to enjoy and know each other a little bit. And um, then I get, I'll go to from the briefing time and early in the morning to later. Uh, our weekends, I don't know if 
county is run the same way, but uh, to match the load of, of calls, our normal daytime from Monday through Thursday runs from seven to like four, uh, I think that's right, four or five. Then there's a, there is a, the, the swing shift comes in at like four o'clock and ties over till about two. And then graveyard comes in around 10 and goes to eight in the morning. Uh, so they're like three, 10 and a half hour shifts. And then the, um, or 10 hour shifts. And then the weekends, these guys go three, 12 and a half. Uh, and that's, imagine working, working that kind of job, 12 and a half hours a day. Uh, but it's only three days. It's brutal on the body and it's tough on the relationships. And it's, it takes you out of your weekends because that's gone. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, our work, our sleep. And uh, it's hard on families. Young families get that shift a lot. Um, and that's why it's sometimes really hard to get to know new officers because they get the lousy shifts and we aren't going to ride with them then <laughs> unless we're really dedicated. Uh, and the newest officers are going to be on um, field officer training. Um, so they, they're going to be, they're already going to have somebody on the right seat who is an experienced officer and they're not yet cleared to go with, uh, with us. I've had officers who have just come off of FTO and I'm their first ride citizen rider. Uh, that's kind of fun because you can break them in. Okay. So yes, sir, Mark. Uh, the only thing that um, I wanted to bring up is what you were talking about crime scenes and things like that. Uh, the only advice that I would give as well is to think about, um, especially if evidence could potentially be an issue, um, learn to stick your, your hands in your pockets. Mm -hmm. um, we have a tendency as human beings to want to touch stuff. And a lot of times if we go into some place, and even though we may think it has absolutely nothing to do with the crime or anything along those lines, we start putting our hands, you know, to pick something up and look at it or twist it a different way. And it potentially could be something that, that could be of evidentiary value. So learning to put your hands in your pockets to make sure that you're not reaching out and grabbing a hold of things you probably should. Amen to that. And or uh, as soon as you get into a, a situation where you know things might be touchy, <clears throat> you get your leather gloves on so that you're not adding your fingerprints to anything that's out and around. Yep. Not only protecting yourself, but protecting the evidence and the things that are in your contact. I, I know that when I go into homes that uh, there have been a death or some reason to bring us into private dwellings, um, an awful lot of them you'll find uh, you might consider hoarders uh, or people who just, just gather stuff up that the top surfaces of every object table, dresser, you name it, is completely full of things. Uh, a lot of pharmaceutical things, cans, you know, pizza boxes, whatever. It's just people, don't, people who are in trouble tend to be messy and not throw stuff away and get and fall into a kind of a depressed state so that they don't feel powerful enough to clean up their place. Sometimes you'll find outfits like this you're not going to be tempted to touch anything. Trust me. <laughs> you will just keep hands in the pocket. Sounds like a really, really good idea at such times. Uh, be nice. Talk to them. Don't touch. Don't touch things. And, um, and so forth. There will be times when you can be an aide to the officer to watch around the side of a building while he's going in the front way or going around the other way. You go the opposite side and just stand there and just offer up uh, no escape for somebody who they're looking to keep keep from getting away. Um, they don't know who you are, but they'll, they'll believe that you got a uniform on and that you're a problem so that they will stop. Uh, don't try to tackle anybody, but um, give sharp orders if you need to. We've done that. Uh, we've run after some escaping guys who uh, go, got hidden around and I've been able to discover them. We had a once a very fun thing. I was uh, involved in it right along with one of our officers, a guy I really like and respect. 
and he he got called in to join the Bentif uh, Bentif drug raid. Bentif is the Butte County uh, interdiscipline interdepartmental um, narcotics task force. Okay. There, okay. It's, cops love uh, anagrams. They just love these these uh, these funny words. So Bentif is that. So um, it was in their offices office was in Chico, but it's a, it was a secret office of Bintif. But the officer said, you want to come along for this? I said, darn right. So let's go. And um, we went in and then I found out that they were going to raid the place of a woman I had had contact with a few months before because her baby died at Sid's death. And the officers were trying to revive her. Uh, and I had the job of getting uh, her her bulldog, her pit bull, on a leash and getting it de delivered from somebody to somebody else while she went to the hospital. Well, um, I come into this Bintiv meeting. They're talking about raiding her house uh, because they got they got meth stuff in there, and there was there was a meth buy in the park the night before, so they knew she was dealing, and they were going to come bust her. So we go there and we're going to go there. And I said, you know, I know something about this woman and about her domicile there. She's got a pit bull. And they said, she's got a pit bull. I said, yeah, well, that's good information, chaplain. Thank you for that. So uh, we go to the house and me and my officer are assigned to go around the side door as the bin tip guys are going to come in the front door. And they have what they call a, a hooligan or a, uh, it's it's just a huge iron bar with with pry things on it and and battering ram. It's a, it's a joint battering ram and a pry bar that opens doors pretty effectively. So they knocked on the front door, rap rap rap. Police opened the door, and then they started to bang on it with this hooligan. Well, they couldn't get it to open because they had taken this racing tire as a racing tire that was about that thick, uh, and just big and heavy and they had pushed it against the front door as a block against opening it while they were asleep uh so uh bentip is banging this door and trying to get this thing and every time they bent the door in this this dog was barking out through the crack in the door rah, rah, rah. they go slam rah, rah, rah. and uh so my officer who was just talented as heck i've seen him doing this a couple of times just put his knee to the side door that we were at and boing, it springs right open. And so we're in, you know. So he goes in and there's three suspects come crawling down the, the hallway and he hooks them all up. And I see a door slowly closing next to him. I said, there's a guy in there. And so he went in there and got that guy. So we had we got three guys who are handcuffed in the hallway that we got. And the Binta finally opened the door, the front door, and out comes the dog. And the dog comes racing over around the building our way. Now, I've already made friends with this dog. So he's coming straight at me. And I went, here, boy, here, boy, come on here. And uh, so they're all like thinking he's going to tear me apart. And I grabbed a hold of him. And we were all loving each other. Oh, la, la, la. OK, yeah, you're under arrest, too. And uh, so we got all, all four of the bad guys, including the dog, uh, with the, the Chico PD guys who were just the adjunct to the Bentif Proud Day. Uh, took a little part in this deal, and uh, there's that competitive nature right there, Pete. You You're proud day. You guys won. We won. Yep. Yep. It was fun. Anyway, uh, go out, have have fun, be safe, uh, add something to the officers' lives, and the fact that you're out there says a lot. It doesn't take a lot of words to be able to convey the fact that we like them. We're coming into their world from the outside, from the uh, official public, and saying, we like you and we, lo we love what you do. Uh, we're not against you. We're for you. Uh, that says a lot to the cops, because they're not hearing that from the public very often. Uh, the, the awards that they get and the recognitions that they get are important when they have events like special recognition and badgings and, and awards offered because they, they need the pat on the back. They're doing such terrible work uh, for all of us that uh, it's important to give them as much respect and honor as we can.
Okay. Yeah, Mark. Hey, Peter. One, other, one other thing I would add to, to the chaplains is uh, don't be surprised, like Bishop had said before, that, you know, when you first go out and contact these officers, don't be surprised if they're kind of standoffish with you and things like that. I know my experience, we didn't get chaplains until probably about the mid nineties. I want to say it was and myself and I know several other uh, deputies that I worked with that, you know, when we talked about the chaplaincy program coming in, the, <laughs> and, and I don't want to put this the wrong way for you guys, but a lot of times we kind of had that mindset. Okay, here come a bunch of do-gooders and we really wanted to, not do the wrong thing in front of them as it were so um if you guys just you know they're, they're like i say they're liable to be standoffish so um just kind of like bishop said is is you know try and gain their trust and go from there and eventually um i know in my case i loved having the chaplains riding along with me it was great um i even had some of them when i was a dog handler they were riding in the car with me with my patrol dog so um it uh we had a really good time with it and, and uh, but it, it's a very, very important program and, and, you know, having you guys out there to, to help these officers through their troubles and, and, you know, maybe provide some additional insight to some of the things they have to experience. Real good. Thanks for all your guys' uh, information. It's been yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you very much for the time. Appreciate it. You're most welcome. I will be issuing all of you guys a letter to indicate you have completed the course properly. You can show it to your departments. I'll send it to you uh, directly. And uh, real good. Awesome. All right. Well, I mentioned thanks, everyone. my badge, the old fashioned badge. I don't know if I can get as close enough to you so you can see it, but uh, that's what the Chico PD has gone to, which is look, looks like an old sheriff's badge or an old sort of Wyatt Earp kind of <laughs> looking badge. But because the Chico PD is 150 years old, they they did a throwback uh, badge for a year, and they decided they like it better than our our old ones. So they're going back to this. So this is actually the the memorial badge. I'll get one that doesn't have the 150 years on it. And nice. God bless you all. Uh, let me let me offer a prayer here, and we'll let you go. Dear Lord God, bless all these good gentlemen who are offering their lives and their selves and their ministry. For the sake of um, law enforcement officers who deserve it and need it, may uh, their steps be all watched over by your holy angels. May uh, we do good and not um, offend. May we add to the lives of those officers who need it and deserve it so much uh, and so well. And I pray a blessing upon them in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. 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 Thanks, Peter. Thanks, guys. We'll be talking. Thank you.